Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Money and Market Squaw Call, where we go around the horn with all of our editors and traders to give you their insights on the happenings in global financial markets both this week and beyond. It's Tuesday, May 27th, and joining us on today's call are Larry Edelson, Mike Larson, Doug Davenport, Bill Hall, Mandy Bry, Don Lusick, and Larry McMillan. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining the Squaw Call here on Tuesday morning. Uh, the 27th of May, we have uh, kind of a full agenda this week, although it's a, it's a short and trading week because of uh, the holiday. We saw that uh, durable goods orders actually picked up a little bit better than, uh, surprisingly better than expected here in, uh, in the month of April. So uh, that was a good bit of data to start the week. Later on, we get uh, first quarter GDP numbers on Thursday and, of course, consumer confidence uh, on uh, Friday. So it should be an interesting uh, week. Let's go around the horn and, uh, and see what uh, our various editors and traders have on their mind. We'll let's start with you, uh, Larry. Uh, not much. I'm, not just for me. I'm a little bit surprised. I was expecting a down day for gold today, but we're down a little bit more than I expected. Uh, so I'm a little concerned with the weakness there. We've got to hold that again, that 1268 level, which we seem to be holding at the moment. Um, uh, ditto for silver. Uh, stock market, you know, this team just doesn't want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, this keeps going up, up, up. <laughs> it's amazing to me. Um, even though I'm long-term search on the thing, I mean, it's got to correct at some point. It's got, and, and the longer it holds off, the after that correction is going to be. Um, dollar showing some strength, which is not surprising to me. And the euro, uh, we got a little bounce off of that depth of the statement from last week and the week before, but it's preparing for another leg down. So, mixed bag. I need a little more action to see uh, after this, this long holiday and, and all the elections in Europe, which were um, quite a thing. A lot of third parties took over in France and uh, in other countries, we're seeing the emergence of third parties, which is something I expected. We'll see that here by 2016, I think. We'll see a third party emerge. Anyways, uh, uh, I need to put up market action uh, to see how how uh, traders uh, felt about that news. So uh, you've been saying for a while, Larry, that you think we're pretty close to a uh, probably a major inflection point in gold, silver, the precious metals, including some of the mining stocks. Yeah. You think that that could happen this summer? We finally see a bottom and then uh, take off to the upside. Well, we're very close to it. We're, we're at a pivotal point here. I mean, there's still the one in sand that uh, I've drawn, which is about six thirty in spot, and uh, we came close to testing that. Again, this morning, I don't like the fact that gold and silver are trading so sideways for the last few months. That's, that's on the one hand, not as bullish as I would like to see, but on the other hand, it could form a diagonal to the upside, which is a very painful throw type formation. So, so um, overall, my long term models have gotten extremely bullish on those, but uh, we're not seeing that impulsive to the upside that I'd like to see yet. And uh, that's what I'm looking for, and I haven't seen it yet. But the mining shares, uh, you mentioned the mining shares. The mining shares have done They have bottomed for sure. I have doubts about that. The only question now is how much do they get caught up in the stock market correction if we get a market correction. Right, because they are still stocks. Do they tend to, the mining shares tend to have a higher correlation with the price of gold and silver or with stocks overall? Well, it varies. You know, it, 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 it varies. I mean, you know, if you get a major route in the stock market, everything gets thrown out. With the, you know, the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater. Right. If it's a mild pullback, you know, the mining shares could easily hold their own and even buck the mild mm -hmm. pullback. It depends on what gold does. So it, it's 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 still here to say. The stock market bought me. It should have corrected nicely by now, down to 1767, 1760. And uh, the more it goes down, the nastier the correction is going to be. Okay. Mike Larson, uh, how about your views? What's your take on the market right now? Sure, good morning. Um, I think that, you know, we continue to be getting fairly decent economic news. It's not terrible. It's not fantastic. But, it's, you know, I would characterize it as decent. You mentioned at the outset the durable goods figures that were stronger than expected for the month of April. And I think, uh, you know, outside of housing, uh, that kind of sector that's tied more to what's been going on in interest rates and so on, 
uh, and the loss of the speculative bid and investment of real estate. Uh, I think we're we're doing okay, and in that environment, uh, you know, we tend to argue for higher interest rates and so on. Uh, the fact that we haven't seen it, of course, makes a lot of people wonder what's going on. You know, interest rates rose sharply in 2013. They've generally been correcting lower to the two and a half, two point six percent, or so on a ten-year note uh, for the last few months. And the question is, why aren't they going up? Especially if stocks are going up, is there something we're missing out there? Uh, and I think that's probably one of the biggest questions that investors are, are concerned with. Um, I think, you know, of all the stories out there that I'm watching and things that are most interesting to me in this environment, sort of this depth of volatility, uh, you know, if you remember that sort of early 1980s, I think, uh, was it Business Week or whatever, the cover story that said the depth of equities. Right. And that was what was published right at the beginning of the biggest bull run in stocks and, you know, in decades. Uh, and right now we've got this utter depth of volatility. Um, and it's not, you know, not just the VIX, which measures the stock market volatility, but the Move Index, which measures volatility and interest rate. Um, some very other uh, volatility indices that measure things like FX volatility, foreign exchange volatility, they're all extremely suppressed. I mean, we're talking about levels we haven't seen since really right around the peak of the uh, the last bubble phase in 2006, early 2007. So the question becomes, is that a contrary indicator? Does that mean the market's in for more trouble, uh, or is this just what you expect in a market that's generally grinding higher? Um, I tend to think that, that when we get extreme complacency, that it's one of those times where you want to be a little more cautious um, so that's what I've been doing. I've been taking a few profits off the table here and there. I've been putting a little more hedging in. Um, you know, I select individually vulnerable stocks that have not been performing up to uh, what the market overall has been doing. I think that's kind of, you know, if they can't perform in a market that's nudging up to new highs, you know, what does that say about the underlying fundamental weakness? I think that tells you these stocks have some, some deeper problems. But, uh, you know, it's not an all let's go short call. It's not an all dump everything. But it is certainly something that you got to keep an eye on here because the, the price of insurance, downside insurance, has collapsed. And, again, it's not just in, in equities. It's across the board. Uh, and so that's one of those potentially worrisome signs going forward I'm keeping an eye, keeping an eye on. Certainly a good uh, cause for caution right now. Uh, let's see. Doug Davenport, you follow the trends in all the major markets pretty closely. Why don't you give us your uh, technical take on where we sit? Good morning to everyone, and thank you. Uh, I think that they'll start with the stock market, that if we can if we can see a sustained and significant upside follow-through that's built on uh, last week's breakout in the S&P that we saw, instead of this bull trap <clears throat> that we've seen happen twice in the last couple of months where the market uh, looks like it's going to break out and it <clears throat> traps the bulls up there and pulls back down, now, if we can uh, finally uh, get above this and continue, which it obviously looks like from the futures today that we're going to, then I've got three upside targets for the S&P. The first is 1903. Uh, well, we're going to hit that today, but uh, I was looking at this last night. And that's basically just a, cup, a very short-term cup and handle pattern that formed it targeted 1903 when I was looking at the charts on Saturday. <clears throat> the second one would be 1928 on the S&P, and that's a target from the um, this trading range or box that we have been in. And <clears throat> that target, if you take a measured move, it's at 1928. And then for a more aggressive, you can look at uh, an inverse head and shoulder pattern that's been formed in April. If you take the April 4th high and the April 11th low, you get an 82-point uh, pattern there, and you add that to 1900 on the S&P, you get about 1980. So that's <clears throat> that's a more aggressive call, but it could easily be done. 1980 on the S&P can easily be done uh, uh, coming up. Now, <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> horse. Uh, last week, uh, it's amazing. You look back, you see NASDAQ strong as can be. You've got the momentum names all breaking their short-term, downturn resistance lines like Facebook, Tesla. Google, Netflix, Amazon, all very attractively priced uh, last week. Netflix was even up 14%. So those are momentum names that certainly should be in uh, someone's portfolio, in my opinion, if you're using individual equities. Biotechs did quite well. Semiconductors did well. Consumer discretionary even had a new buy signal even on, on the uh, uh, ETF for consumer discretionary last week. Transport's looking great. And even home construction, uh, surprisingly, turning around and I was doing some reading this weekend. You look, you can see that adjustable rate mortgages appear to be back among the banks around the United States. But the difference between now and, and the last time we had a real estate uh, bubble is that these are 10 and 15 year arms that last fixed rate 10 years, 15 before they begin to adjust. And they even have the interest only back again. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of that is, is that banks are starting to lend in real estate once again. And, 
if you get people buying homes, that helps the real estate. Excuse me, that helps the stock market. So I think that's a bullish sign. Sorry, I got a little bit of a cold. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange advanced a decline index. Uh, hit an all. I mean, hit a, a new high last week. So that looks good for the equity market. Two sectors that I have in my portfolio: uh, energy and services and basic materials. They hit all-time new highs last week, and those have been two of the best-performing sectors. Uh, XLE was up over 7.8% so far this quarter, and basic materials up six, over 6% 6 for this quarter. So good performance from two uh, sectors that it really lagged last year. Gold, well, here, here once again, you wake up, and the futures market de uh, determines where gold is going overnight. So you see gold uh, flushing down again today. I've been bearish on gold for a couple of months. That's what the, at least I say I've been bearish. My charts have been bearish. And uh, gold is certainly below its 200-day and 50-day moving averages. And this triangular pattern that it is right now is in is negative and should follow through. Well, that's what I wrote in my notes yesterday, and it's doing that tonight. So I don't have any idea where gold will come down to. I just hope it keeps going further down since I'm short. RG Markets, you've got four straight weeks of performance uh, doing well there as the India leads that parade. Momentum is picking up in the emerging market. U.S. Treasuries, well, I'm short uh, TLT and have been short since January. And TLT, basically, uh, the bond market's smarter than the stock market, and it says it's, the economy's slowing down, at least it has for the last five months. Of course, we know that can all change, but you know, in the fifth year of uh, expansion, um, you shouldn't see long duration bonds uh, declining in yield the way they have, but that's what's happened. Uh, I don't see any reason that TLT or 10 year treasuries would trade below 2% or above 3% for, for quite a while. Uh, of course, the forecast can be wrong, but there's just no reason for that to be any higher than 3 or lower. Well, it could go lower than 2 if we have deflationary problems. Uh, uh, outside the U.S., uh, the euro, Draghi's been trying to talk the euro down uh, since a couple of weeks ago, and he did. He got it down to about 136.45. Uh, my long-term charts on the euro are still bullish uh, since August of 2012. It hasn't broken the trend line yet, and the technical indicators from momentum and trending certainly are, are still uh, positive, and it have to get below 130. Four or five, I guess, on the euro for the trend has changed on a longer term period for the euro. It may, may not happen, who knows? But the euro has been grinding its way higher since the summer of 2012. And last but not least, crude oil, another difficult market. If anybody's ever traded crude oil, it is one of the most difficult markets to ever trade. But China could be, I think, right now, it could be the reason that we're seeing that uh, crude oil is still above $100 a barrel. There really shouldn't be any reason with shale oil and everything going on that crude should be above 100 But uh, China did some research this week. Uh, China consumes about 10 billion barrels of oil a day, and they produce only 4.2 million barrels a day. So that gives you a deficit. And in April, they imported 6.8 million barrels, which was the highest amount they'd ever imported. And I think it's kind of like copper, that when oil gets down to a certain level, then Chinese buy it, put it in the warehouse, for lack of a better word, like they do copper. So with oil, you've got major resistance at 105 um, uh, a barrel, and you've got the support down at 91, which is this trading range it's been in since last summer. If it pops above 105, it could maybe go to 112. And if it drops back below 98, it'll go back down to 91. So I'm just sitting here waiting to see which direction that it may be. But that's my story for the uh, for the week. Okay, Doug, thanks for covering all those trends. Uh, let's move on to uh, Bill Hall. Bill, I know you follow the uh, the macro side of the market pretty closely, deflation and debt and deleveraging and all all the other Ds. Why don't you uh, give us your two cents? Yes, I, I, I believe that the market's still uh, dominated by the five Ds, debt, deficit, demographic, deleveraging, and deflation. And right now, deflation is the preeminent factor that's uh, that's weighing on the global economy and the market. You know, we hit it an all-time high on the S&P 500 on uh, Friday, um, but the breadth, there's not a lot of breadth in that number, so that's concerning. So I believe that we may be at a tipping point where we're going to see, we may see de deflationary forces that start to overwhelm the economy despite what the Fed and the ECB are doing. Uh, and without growth, uh, and a deflationary environment, I think it's very, going to be very hard for stocks to make advances. 
and I see some big downside here. But I don't think we're there just yet, but I think it's something that has to be watched very closely. So in my portfolios and my subscription services, I remain long. I remain, uh, I remain invested, but uh, I'm ready to move to a very defensive uh, position here pretty quickly if, if, if things turn. Okay. Uh, Mandy Bry, let's uh, let's get your take on uh, what your some markets, particularly in some of the smaller caps. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I kind of uh, echo the same sentiment as the rest of the uh, traders here, uh, cautiously long, watching the markets. You know, as as well as everybody else, the tech and then uh, small caps have kind of led uh, some of the the declines and the correction. The the larger cap stocks haven't really participated, uh, not even close to the same magnitude. Um, but they're they're leading uh, now. Uh, Friday's all-time high breakout. The uh, the Russell's back above the 200-day moving, um, and the continuation of we see the futures this morning uh, rallying on uh, favorable uh, elections in Europe, Ukraine. Uh, even you know so, some of this complacency, I, I will call, is uh, you know you see Thailand was interesting because you had the military coup, but yet you saw the CDS spreads narrow. Um, Mike was talking about the volatility at, at uh, you know, super low levels uh, across different uh, asset classes. And then you have uh, corporate profits are okay here in the U.S., and not you know, tremendous, but generally you're, supp- you're supposed to, you know, we, we quote it supposed to because this isn't uh, uh, normal times. You know, we have this Fed uh, li- liquidity that's been pumped into markets. Normally you'll see every 18 months a correction of about 10% or so uh, in the broader markets, and we haven't seen that in 30 plus months. So with, with those sorts of uh, you know, complacency and so forth, it, it, it's, it's, it's prudent to be cautious about the markets at current levels. Um, and, and that's the kind of the way that we're playing our, in our portfolio. If you have a faster moving portfolio, it's okay. Uh, you know, you can you can take on tactical positions in some of these speculative names. Uh, you know, to take advantage of some of the displacements. But generally, we've looked at the the previous earnings season, and we look for companies that have beat earnings, beat the uh, uh, the top line. They have grown both of those, guiding in line or better have catalysts, strong executing management teams, um, looking for higher ratings in these companies, and we're kind of building a portfolio to help us insulate some of this uh, the volatility in the markets and, and are going to catch a bid when, when the, uh, the risk on trade comes. So, uh, so we're taking advantage of that, uh, but we are remaining cautious. One of the things that we also noticed was, uh, was China. China seems to be something that uh, the, the market PMI, uh, it's not the official PMI, but it's the HSBC one. Showed that it's reversing its course after five months of uh, five quarterly declines. Um, it's still in contraction territory, but it's 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 uh, it's uh, contracting by less. Uh, and we just saw the export numbers for China be better than uh, expected. That's it grew by 8.9 percent. Um, so the, it's it's too early to call the all clear. But you, you're probably going to see a bit in, in China and you know global uh, growth uh, thesis comes back online. Um, one of the things I, I mentioned about China is that we, you know, the, the housing bubble, the, the shadow banking system, and, and the uh, the ghost towns that they've kind of created are depicting demand. Uh, decades into the future, the Chinese are kind of like looking forward to, to you know, the. the the, the folks coming out of the farms, out of rural areas, and coming to these cities. Uh, the problem with that is that they aren't being bought just yet. So the developers are leaning to the banks for you know they still have to pay the interest payments on these on these uh, these debt leveraged uh, housing facilities. We're just looking to see if the government can continue to support that. And and the indications are that it will. It, it, they, they, they implanted injected about 120 billion won last week into the monetary system. So. So for now, continuation, we think markets are okay. Uh, it bodes to be, uh, your prudence is, is, is needed here, being cautious is being needed here, but uh, the risk is on right now. Okay. Certainly would be some uh, interesting opportunities in some of these emerging markets like China that are very undervalued uh, relative to uh, the S&P 500. Thanks for the uh, the comments. Uh, Don Lusick, I know you look at through the lens of the Weiss uh, stock ratings model, uh, what is the model telling you about the 
the best stocks and sectors to be in right now? Well, the the ratings in general are uh, are deteriorating, and they have been uh, here for the past several weeks. Uh, in general, uh, in terms of individual sectors, there haven't been too many clues other than the earnings season that we've just come through. Uh, so you're seeing some some pretty uh, some pretty uh, stable ratings in the stable uh, in the stable sectors, say uh, utilities, telecom. Uh, you're seeing some deterioration now, uh, interestingly enough, um, in financials uh, and in energy, um, and that you know that kind of that that correlates very well with the uh, the performance of companies uh, in the past quarter uh, earnings-wise, because that's those the, you know financials and uh, and energy are where you saw the the greatest weakness year over year uh, in terms of uh, earnings growth, and um, you know that's that's healthy. Uh, that, that that's that's actually healthy. I I don't like to see the uh, the the uh, results uh, of the Weiss ratings model indicate too bullish or too bearish uh, a, a tilt uh, over short periods of time. And the reason for that is that um, it needs the the, the 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 model's algorithms do need longer periods of time. To make a, 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 a solid judgment, because it's built for investors, it's not really built for traders. Um, so, th you know, that said, what we've seen, I think, was you know, not a great, not a great earnings season. I, it reminds me a lot of first quarter of 2013, uh, where we had you know a decent earnings uh, performance by companies and some. Yeah, not even like just just subpar uh, revenue performance by companies uh, in terms of you know um, uh, uh, beating or missing estimates. And what we're looking for in the second half of the year, we're, we're, we're you know it sounds like you know it sounds like the broken record of every economic recovery that we've ever heard is that you know you know first half might have been you know kind of whacked by weather or what have you, but second second half, look out. That, that's where we're going to see the see the growth. And you know, and I think that that's I, I think that's still valid. I think that uh, that economically, so the economic backdrop is still somewhat supportive of of recovery of uh, of, of 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 earnings. Uh, and revenues. Uh, well, you want to see the revenues because that's basically that's where the weak point was in the quarter. Uh, I think we're like 98, 99 percent through uh, the, uh, the quarterly reporting season. Saw so about three quarters uh, of companies uh, beating estimates, and that's good. That, that's good to see. But then you get the sore thumb at the end of it, which was uh, you know last week's retail reports, which were atrocious. I mean, you know. Hit or miss, you know, like a Nordstrom, uh, Macy's did well, uh, but you know, some so, so some of the sort of old school uh, retail plays did 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 rather well uh, earnings wise, but uh, you know, your sort of uh, specialty retail uh, it was so it was very hit or miss this quarter, um, and that that you know where does that reduce to? You know, what's the common denominator there? Uh, it's consumer spending, obviously, and um, you know the jobs picture is not as supportive as we'd like to see it here. Um, and you know we'll get a jobs report next week. Uh, hopefully, you know hopefully we can continue on this uh, this skein of uh, of decent uh, jobs reports, um, and we'll see. This Friday actually we'll have um, I think um, uh, personal uh, income and spending. And that'll be a clue to you. And you'll get the you know final uh, Michigan confidence for uh, uh, for the month as well on Friday. And um, you know that that's something to look at. I think that you know the all focus should be on the consumer. With with, with the bigger ones, uh, with with the more sort of big uglies like financials and uh, and um, and energies, uh, and even in, even you know into the industrials. I think that you need to. I think that you need to watch these stocks because there is there had been a lot of sort of uh, uh, bullish uh, sentiment in all three of those sectors leading up to here, and that's where I think you might 
start to see some some erosion. Uh, I'm still, you know, I'm still um, looking at getting longer uh, right now, and I still am looking for pro cyclicals. Uh, so no change really there in the sort of general philosophy. And I think that you know, I think that uh, the ratings, uh, the Weiss ratings, are supportive of that here. Uh, I think that uh, that that we will see uh, some pick up in second half GDP. My 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 concern though is that there is this risk to the downside, and I think Mandy mentioned the word complacency, and I think that that's kind of what you're seeing here. I mean, yes, we hit a new high uh, last last week in the S and P. Um, it was on really shit volume though, you know, so. I think that you really want to see some real volume supporting these moves and not just, you know, arbitrageurs or what have you, uh, 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 um, you know, trading back and forth day to day. You don't, you, you, we haven't seen that yet. I think, honestly, I think that we're going to see a pretty quiet summer. And in, in an environment like that, I think that it's a, it, it, it's a good idea to start picking and choosing. I mean, I think that, you know, and time horizons are going to lengthen as well. I think that the general market participant is going to start looking to 2015 earlier than usual. And so we're going to really be uh, on a sort of a, uh, we're on a path towards higher prices. Uh, Doug said that, you know, that, that we can get up to 1980 on the, on the, uh, on the, on the S&P without too much problem. I agree with that, and I wouldn't be surprised to see us hit 2,000 on the S&P you know, within six to nine months. I wouldn't be surprised to see it at all. And I think that should we have a continuation of what we're seeing, that that that, that will be more or less uh, justified. It, it, you know, and, and if it isn't justified, it'll be just it, it'll be it'll be it'll be uh, a little bit more sentiment driven to the upside. Now that said. Again, I think that there is a risk to the downside here. But I just don't see where it's going to come from. I don't see the catalyst that's going to uh, uh, shock the markets here. Uh, you know, wars and rumors of wars uh, that, 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 that some of us talk about. Uh, you know, that could be it. Uh, China, you know, don't forget that they're a command economy. So, you know, the, 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 the recent crackdown on sort of uh, – uh, profligate spending uh, on the part of uh, Chinese consumers is, is, is they're, they're, you know the, the government is stepping in and trying to curb that right now. So that 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 is a worrying sign. Uh, you know it's something to watch. But um, you know for now, in in the absence of uh, of evidence to the contrary, I think that right now you should be building long positions in pro cyclical sectors. Uh, I, I, I believe that the, that the Weiss ratings back me up on that, and uh, you know, experience backs me up on that as far as like how economic cycles work. Uh, and then you know, your last leg of the stool is sentiment, and sentiment. Well, you still have a lot of individual investors on the sideline. Should we get? Should we start seeing a rally in the back half of the, half of the year? That sort of you know where volume picks up. I think that that will be. A signal that we have a return of the individual investor, and that'll be fantastic for uh, for stock prices. All right, great insights, Don. I appreciate uh, appreciate your thoughts on the subject. Uh, let's see. I think that uh, pretty much covers everyone, unless there's somebody else on the call. I'm I'm not picking up here, or recognizing. Uh, yeah, Mike, it was Larry McMillan. Oh, hey, Larry, how are you? Why don't you uh, give us some of your insights for the uh, for the market? I know you keep a close eye on your uh, proprietary put call ratios. Uh, what are they telling you about the uh, the odds of uh, new highs here? Yeah, I'll just keep a break because the market's about to open. Um, you know, put call ratios are pretty much uh, nowhere. They're <laughs> yeah, they're they're in, in general conflict. Some are some are bullish, some are bearish. Obviously, volatility is uh, really low. The Short term VIX just uh, on Friday closed at 975, which is an all time low for that. Not that that goes back that far. They only have that extending back a few years. But VIX closed below 12. So again, you know, over what situations, but um, as I, I think Mike Larson said, you know, the, the, the new 
thing is to be short volatility, and uh, everybody's trying to short volatility. So, you know, it's you know, it seems like it's working right now, but um, you know, you probably are best uh, served by using this cheap volatility to buy some protection. Um, other than that, if the, you know, if the market breaks out to the high of the day, which it will on the open, if it holds that into the close, the SPX chart is bullish, and that, you, know, you really can't fight the chart. So, um, you know, I, I don't. You know, while, while the last couple of times it has failed at this level because uh, we had some overbought conditions when it got to the new highs, if it, if it holds this eight-point breakout into the close, uh, I think most of the shows will have to fill in the panel at that point. So <clears throat> that's about it. Okay, thanks, Larry. Well, that wraps things up here for this week's Squawk Call. Some terrific insights, gentlemen. Thank you for your, for, uh, your input very much. And also be sure to tune in again next week. Until then, I'm Mike Burnick for Money and Markets. Good investing.